My Taste with Bibendum Wine, supplier to the UK's top restaurants and bars. Hello from Nigel Williams and welcome to our programme which seeks to augment your food and drink experiences with the help of our studio guests. This week, restaurant owners and brothers Sam and Eddie Hart. They famously took Spanish food to another level in this country with their restaurant Fino, followed by the genuine tapas bar Barafina. Food is very much in their DNA, as you're about to hear. Sam, Eddie, welcome. Now, your father had a Michelin star restaurant, but Sam, you didn't go and work for him. No, I mean, I, I had spent a few summers working in the kitchens there growing up. But um, having seen restaurants from the inside, I always vowed that I'd have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, gradually over <laughs> as time passed, I got sucked and sucked into it. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, uh, Eddie, you went straight for it. So a bit of a difference there. Um, you would have seen the same horror sights in the kitchen that your brother did, but um, you didn't mind so much. Well, I, I couldn't really think of, of, of what else to do or, or who else w w would employ me. Um, and, and I thought that my, my dad, certainly to start with, was you know, likely to kind of, you know, give me a, a job, you know, reluctantly perhaps, <laughs> and um, and you know, and so it was it was straight into the kind of, into the kind of kitchen pot wash, um, you know, and, and rolled up my sleeves. But I, I, I loved it. I, I loved the kind of the human element of the restaurant business, and and um, so no, I've, I've, I'm afraid I've always had the bug. Um, and this is quite an art market. They, they had a Michelin star, didn't they, your dad? Dad, Dad opened a, a small, um, you know, kind of luxury country house hotel mm -hmm. um, in a county called Rutland. Um, about two and a half hours north of London, and um, and it, it, it's it's lovely. It, it's right on the, on the on Rutland Water, um, so it was it was a great place to kind of you know to work and cut my teeth. Yeah, uh, and so after pot wash, what what happened to you then after that? You got then, moved then I up. Kind of escalated. I was promoted to the dizzy heights. I think probably of a waiter after that. But you're um, forgetting chambermaid. Oh, chambermaid. Yes, ch chambermaid. Um, <laughs> although I didn't have to wear a pinny, which which, which was you know, a bit of a relief. <laughs> But um, you know, so, no, but what was what's nice about a hotel as a as a training ground, you know, if you want to be in the, in the industry, is that you know, you if if you're lucky enough, you can be moved around the, the different departments, so you, you get to have a look at um, you know all, all the different kind of aspects. Mm -hmm. So the good grounding for you there. Uh, meanwhile, Sam, you had a, a could I call it a dalliance with the the city, uh, and then then off to Mexico. What's the story there? Yeah, so uh, well, I, I I was working as a as a money broker in London. And um, got the opportunity to to go to Mexico City to help open their office there. Mm -hmm. um, and I love Mexico City, hated money broking, um, and ended up opening a nightclub um, in, in in Mexico City, which which we, I was I stayed for five years doing that. This isn't the safest city in the world. Uh, so was it risky business? Uh, Yes, I mean Mexico exactly was is quite a dangerous city. We, we used to, have to um, occasionally confiscate guns at the door um, if we had famous people with their bodyguards. We, we, yes. we didn't really like bodyguards coming in because yes. they're professional fighters rather than drunk yeah. amateur fighters, so it can cause real damage. But if if they had to, if it was someone like the president's son or something, we'd um, we'd confiscate their guns and we occasionally have a sort of great stack of firearms in our office. Wow. Um, but no, we we survived it. So it was um, yeah, and, and good fun, exciting, interesting grounding. So I guess putting the two of you back together, then, so your your brother's back at home, learning the the nitty gritty of the restaurant business. You're doing the running the business stuff. When did it come together that you were going to start working together? Well, I, I had a sort of six months living in Barcelona on the way back from Mexico to acclimatise to European life once again and fell in love with Spanish food and um, in particular a, a restaurant there called Cal Pep um, and got a phone call from Eddie saying, oh, you know, you're not really doing anything in Barcelona, why don't we get together and do something back in, in England? Um, and actually to start with, we thought we might open a pub in the countryside and spent probably three or four months, I reckon, on that project. And um, until my now wife, then girlfriend, said, look, you're, you're only 26 or 27, we'll go stir crazy, yeah. sitting in this pub in the countryside. Um, and and why don't we you know, go and do something in, the, in London? So we, we, with our sort of experience of Spanish food and love of Spanish food, we, we did Fino. And this experience, uh, Eddie, came from your mum in Mallorca, is that right? Mum grew up in, in, in a small village on the, on the northwest coast in, in Mallorca. 
um, and summer holidays have, have always been there, you know, in the house where she grew, grew up. So we've, you know, um, I suppose we've always had a real kind of passion for all, all things Hispanic. Um, and in fact, mum, you know, always used to kind of cook, you know, very, very you know, um, Spanish influenced kind of food. And I, I remember kind of garlic, um, you know, when we were growing up in, in Rutland um, in the kind of late 70s, uh, early 80s. Um, you know, was still a pretty exotic, you know, ingredient, um, as were red peppers or aubergines. And, and I, I think, you know, quite a lot of our mates who come over for tea or, you know, um, you know <laughs> and, um, you know, just thought that this food was pretty wild yeah. and exotic. And in fact, there were, I think there were friends of mum, mum and dad's growing up then, you know, that would, you know, turn their nose up at this exotic muck. Yes. Um, you know, but it says that that was really our grounding and, and you know, <clears throat> how both Sam and I, I think, you know, you know, came to, uh, you know, be involved with Spanish restaurants. Okay. And is that where you picked up this, you know, what has become the way, if you want to run a fine dining restaurant, this idea of looking for the great ingredients that probably came from mum looking around for the best stuff. Would that be right? Well, I suppose that, our, you know, um, our fathers had a michelin starred restaurant for 33 years now or mm. something. So he, we, we grew up eating extremely well. And he's very keen on on great ingredients, as is our mother, separately. But my real, I think my seminal moment of the really great ingredients was when I was living in um, living in Barcelona and spending time in the Boqueria, which is one of the great markets of the world. And they had amazing ingredients, so mm. they weren't just sort of good; they were really, really world yeah. class. And the Spaniards have a, a thing, um, you know, traditionally, of it being very ingredient led. Um, and simple as well. So it, that's that. It was a sort of real inspiration, I suppose. So you decided that you wanted to do something Spanish in the creation of Fino, but what next? Sam and I um, took a very, very, very small office. And by small, I mean that that we were kind of literally sitting on each other's laps, and you could only be one person on the telephone. Um, you know, you know, you couldn't obviously you couldn't hear hear yourself kind of think. And we spent about a year or longer with with a list of forty agents, um, and we, we split the the list down you know, down the middle. And every day we'd ring these agents and would say, "Please, we know we're looking for a for a restaurant site in London." And um, Sam and I, you know, young, no covenant, um, you know, weren't weren't a particularly attractive kind of, you know, um, you know, proposition to, to central London landlords. And so we really struggled. <clears throat> and, and our dad very sweetly said, "Do you want to come under my umbrella? Yes. You know, and, and so I, I can kind of be a name and 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 kind of a covenant behind you." And we said, "You know, for God's sake, Dad! You know, the last thing we want to do is drag you into some terrible mess." I said, "You know, if we're going to mess this up, we're going to mess it up on our own." Um, and eventually, we, we were shown Fino, which is um, just off Charlotte Street, and um, we never wanted to be in a basement. You know, but basements are famously difficult to, you know, lure your clientele down into. Um, yes. I suppose depending on what you do, what, what, what kind of operation it is. But but, you know, as a restaurant. And so we, but it was quite a glamorous space. It had high ceilings and we thought, you know, we hadn't seen anything any better. So we thought, this is it. Yeah. Um, so actually, you know, we, we, we were excited by the space. So that was the, the start of, uh, the, start. of the journey. And you speculated, what, a million quid on that, Sam? Yeah, it was a million quid. Um, but it was back in the days where the bank would lend you quite a lot of that. Yeah. So I don't think, I mean, we didn't have anything like a million quid. I think we, Eddie and I had scraped together something like 80,000 quid each or something like that. But yes. and we had another couple of investors. Um, but it, it was um, obviously pre-recession and all yeah. that sort of thing. And, and you could, even as a startup, which you'd never get. I mean, these days, we, we, we would still never get um, that sort of ratio yeah. loan from the bank. No way. Yeah. Um, but um, back in those days, you could. Um, it was all a bit easier. So we, we managed to borrow quite a lot um, yes. somehow or another. And then um, because you were sort of young and naive, you then accidentally was a runaway success and you didn't worry about it well d dad dad always said you know that, that kind of you know there's um, a great advantage in being young and naive in business because you you you, you don't you know um foresee you know um the, all the kind of pot the potential potholes and and, yes. and disasters waiting around the corner and and i think there was there was i think it was very nice having dad there also on the end of the phone you know who, who was experienced and a professional and, and been successful in the industry um, you know, and although we, we tried to do it on our own, it was very nice having that backup and that expertise. Um, I suppose we were incredibly lucky because we we, um, we we had a brilliant head chef right from the start, and which was was complete 
luck, really. I mean, because we, we'd interviewed a few different people and they'd done tastings for us, and you know, really, it was they, they all, they've all been incredibly disappointing. Um, and then we went to this um, tasting with our first head chef, Jean Philippe um, Petruno, and he produced a staggering array of something like thirty dishes. <laughs> we, well, yeah. He was I, cooking I, at Simply Nico I, at the time. I, 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 remember, I remember there was four different types of quail. I think three lobsters, and um, anyway, so um, we were completely bowled away by the, the quality of the food. Yes, and it meant that you know, luckily on day one when we opened, where there's plenty of things that weren't right. You know, the service is in a mess and everything's chaos and confused. At least the food was really good right from the beginning, and that that, that um, got us off on the right start. On, on the way to the, the, the tasting with um, Jean Philippe, who became our first head chef. Um, Sam said to me um, on the way, he said, um, I'm really hungry. And I said, well, that, but that's probably quite quite a good thing. We were just heading off to this you know, you know, gigantic tasting. So I said, no, it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. I said, well, what do you, what do you... He said, well, you know, if you're hungry, everything's going to taste delicious. So we stopped <laughs> at, a, at a corner shop and bought a baguette and ate this baguette before we... Which, which I thought I thought was really dedicated, you know, kind of... You know, um. <laughs> that's a great story. What they, there are thousands of restaurants uh, just it, just in London. What was it that at Fino you were trying to provide? What was the gap in the market? I I think we felt that there was still there, were, there, there was plenty of room in London for you know really top quality Spanish food. You know I, I think that you know there, there were lots of tapas restaurants you know in you know in the kind of more of the kind of you know residential areas of, of London but very few really in in in, in central London mm. and I think you know and very few Spanish restaurants that were really serving the very best of Spain and, and I think the reason for that is that a plate of jamón is very expensive you know that there's no way around that you know it, it's it's going to be 18 or 20 pounds in a restaurant for whatever it is a 50 gram portion and, and and I think you know the, the tapas restaurants that or, or, or the majority of them that were around at that time um, you know they're out in the residential areas they, they didn't feel that they could charge that so you know so we we really wanted to bring you know fantastic ingredients the best of Spain to the table and, and serve it in a kind of, you know, West End and hopefully kind of glamorous and, you know, fun environment. And did people get that straight away? You know, it's it's a plate of ham and you're charging me 20-odd quid. Well, amazingly, they sort of did. Or for, for, they didn't sort of did. They definitely did. We, we were we were lucky. We, you know, we opened on our, our first day. Was it our first customer, Jan Moyer? I think Jan Moyer was writing that in the Telegraph at the time. I'm pretty certain she was the first customer through the door. And... Three days later, there was a huge review um, on the back of the Telegraph. She absolutely loved it. Um, and it went from there. And, and then, you know, the rest of the critics, the, the huge majority of them um, came and enjoyed it as well. And, and so did the public. So I think, you know, it was the, the days, the, the, the era of cheap flights had opened up real Spain. So people weren't just doing um, the costas, the costas, and, and the, uh, you know fish and chips on the costas. They were going to cities that they hadn't been before, and so there really was amongst um, the people in London, which is why we thought London was ready for it. Mm. Um, you know, good knowledge and and desire and and to to, to eat proper Spanish food rather than. Um, you know, microwaved Spanish food. How about the wines? Because that's another area where people are probably, if you're into your wines, quite easy to, you know, learn the French regions and know what you're getting. You look through a, a wine list, but th taking that step into Spain, not quite so easy. So did you have that, 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 that challenge with serving Spanish wines? Um, I think people definitely you know, knew what a, 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 you know, Red Rioja was. Um, they might have heard of an Albarino just, I suppose, 11 years ago. Um, and they, and we certainly could have wanted to really champion um, some of our favourite wines from, from Spain, you know, stylistically. Um, so we, we really got behind Sherry, which was, you know, um, you know, which is both Sam and I are passionate about. Um, and it was really rewarding to see um, you know, I'm not saying that we were solely res responsible for it at all, but you know, it was, it was so rewarding at the restaurant to see that over a period of time, our regulars and, and clients really did know what they were talking about, and they would order a cold manzanilla um, and you know, really you know, enjoy it. So, so that was one side, and I suppose we, over a period of time, actually we started with a, a, an international list because we didn't have the the confidence to um, say, well, it's all Spanish, and you know. You know, yes, you know, we'll show you something you um, might yeah, like. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. So there was New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, you know, white burgundy, and I, I, but I can't remember how long 
the international list lasted for? Do you think it was six months or something? About six months. It wasn't. Until, it wasn't that long. And we, we were bullied in, into kind of going completely Spanish, which was which was totally the right thing to do. That's right. Well, we're going to get you to choose some wine a little bit later on. Let's get on to where uh, we talked loads about Fino because this was the start, um, and then you went on to a, a sort of more informal version a, a few years later, didn't you, um, uh, with your Baratinas? So yeah, I mean, um, funny enough that Fino was inspired, as, as I mentioned before, by this restaurant Cal Pep in Barcelona, and but. Cal Pep is much is very very similar to Barafina, which was our second restaurant. Um, so, in the fact that it doesn't have any bookings, is bar only, um, very small, twenty three seats. And funny enough, actually, Barafina shares the same amount of seats as Cal Pep does. But when we opened Fino, we didn't quite have the confidence. We didn't feel London was ready for mm-hmm. you know the the real deal, as it were. Yes. You know, so we had it. We have still have an eating bar at Fino, which is great. But it's also got tables, so you know it blended the two. But after about um, I suppose three years of Fino, we thought that the Spanish food scene in London had moved on enough to do a, a much more purist tapas bar um, and opened Barafina, I think, in 2006 or seven or something like that. Uh, I've got 2007. 2007. Jan- January, January 2007. <laughs> it says that on Wikipedia, so it's got to be true. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, January 2007, exactly. And the, But it was, um, it was really fun because the, all the cooking's straight in front of you. You sit at the bar, it's very small, um, and you have this incredible atmosphere um, and energy, uh, you know, with all the food and all the action going on straight in front of you. So then things got really serious with, uh, not to say it wasn't serious before, but uh, purchasing Quo Vardis, which uh, got such a, a famous history and even got a blue plaque from when Karl Marx lived there. Apparently that was only for, I've got five years here, 1851 to 1856. But anyway, it's famous restaurant, you know, destination restaurant. And you moved in to, to buy that. Uh, why would would that be, Eddie? But very good question. Um, Sam and I actually were, were walking the, the streets of Soho with, with an agent um, looking for a potential um, second site for, for Barafina. And we, I think the, the route between Fino on foot and um, uh, Barafina and Frith Street took us on a daily basis past the front of, of Quo Vadis. And, um, and that time I, I think you know Marco uh, Pierre White had you know w- was kind of towards the end of his time there and, and the building looked slightly looked like it needed some some TLC and um, the agent said, said to us isn't it a fabulous building and someone I said we love it you know it's, it, it's such a you know with a stained glass and it, you know it just you know looked like such a fantastic building and he said um, would you guys ever be interested we said absolutely not no, no, this, this is kind of, you know, so far removed from, you know, and, and it's, it's too big and it's, you know, absolutely not. And he said, you, sh- you sure? And we say, obviously, he planted the seed. Um, and um, Sam and I then started talking about it and kind of somehow couldn't get it out of our, out of our minds. And, you know, and the idea that, um, you know, it slightly needed kind of, you know, you know the next person to kind of t- take, take the reins. But, you know, and that's the great thing about... Um, Quo Vardis is that it doesn't really feel like our restaurant. You're just the you know the custodian for the next yes. period. It opened in 1926, um, so it, you know. But it's it's nice to be part of its history. And um, six, six months later, we had the keys in our hands, um, wondering quite what to do with it. It was probably considerably more than a million, though I'm too polite to to ask. But <laughs> uh, you took the step then of basically closing it all down and starting all over again. Why was that, Sam? Well, it had been run into the ground, I suppose, really, by by um by the previous incumbents, um, and um needed quite a lot of first of all investment, but also it just needed to to stop, to change, and to you know re reopen again. Um, well, I think you know we spent six months, you know, remodelling. I mean, remodelling it um, to the degree that we could. You know, if you did a proper remodel on that building, you could you could be there for years. Yes. Um, you know, because it's been sort of patched and and you know, um, refitted bit by bit over over what's now something like eighty five. I think it's coming up for its ninetieth anniversary quite soon. So, over a long period of time. Well, it's a fine stable of restaurants. Great to hear about. Let's find out about when you're not eating in your own restaurants. Um, Eddie, let's, let's take your first. So close to home. Let's see. You live in a boat. I do. You? So that's uh, what near Chelsea. So uh, but, where'd but you go? You know, underneath kind of Battersea Rail Bridge. Yes. Uh, so where do, where would you go to a neighbourhood restaurant there? What's your favourite? Oh, neighbourhood restaurant there. 
mostly my, my fa favourite restaurants in London tend to be kind of in the West End mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the one that kind of just sprung to mind as a neighbourhood restaurant which I think is is fantastic it's, it's on Frith Street and it's a few, just a couple of doors down from um, us at Barafina and it's called Koya uh, and it's, a, it's an udon noodle um, restaurant and it, it you know I haven't been to Japan although I, I long to go it appears to be very authentic and not kind of um, lightened for the English palate and it's inexpensive delicious um, and that that was what immediately sprung to mind Sam um, I gather you probably don't live on a boat otherwise that would be a bit weird wouldn't it really uh, but uh, <laughs> exactly so no I live in Acton uh, in Acton um, much more down to earth there exactly. proper central line there yeah Acton down to earth not surrounded by great restaurants unfortunately <laughs> I think there's no. a great opportunity for for budding restaurateurs out there to, to come to Acton because, yes um, <laughs> a short hop to Chiswick but that's about your lot so where would you like to where's where do you like to frequent well um I, I used to live in Shepherd's Bush and there's an amazing Thai restaurant on the on the Shepherd's Bush Road called Isan Q, um, which is actually still neighbourhood from Acton because it's just down the road from me, but it's, um, it, it's you know, proper old family-run Thai restaurant and, and, and delicious. Andy, what about a fine diner, special occasion? Um, it's got to be the, 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 the River Cafe in, in Hammersmith. Um, you know, and it, every time I kind of save up and go... Um, you know, it's worth every penny, and uh, you know, I think when it comes to food, I, I don't, I don't really watch the pennies. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the the one thing in my life that I'm very happy to kind of spend, you know, what what it requires to kind of you know to be where you want to be on on that particular occasion. And I, you know, on a, on a summer's day, you know, being there in the window or out on the terrace, and you know, the quality of their ingredients and the 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 knowledge of the the staff, um, you know, is just kind of you know, that's my absolute favourite. The curfew doesn't bother you in the evenings. Uh, does, that was always the thing of being sort of, you know, they had to sort of wrap it up by a certain time because of the, the residents. I, I think go for lunch. Then <laughs> <laughs> so you can stay all afternoon. Yeah, yeah, I think it's probably the way to go. <laughs> and and, and li living on a, on a boat on the river, if, if I'm really lucky and the tides are right, I can get a mate to kind of drop me off yeah. and I just climb up the ladder and over the wall. Wow, that's, um, a, that's a way to live. That sounds great. What about you, Sam, for a fine diner? Well, I think fine, fine diner is, is not a word I'd like to put to restaurants where, where, I, where I'd like to go, but I suppose spe special occasions, so we say. Um, I love St John in um, St John Street in Clerkenwell. Um, it's run by um, our, our great friends Fergus Henderson and Trevor Gulliver, they obviously famous for doing awful and, and weird bits and pieces, but actually the restaurant's got much more to it than that. Mm -hmm. um, they're great champions of, of brilliant British ingredients, um, great champions of simple cooking, but on a, at, a, at a very high level. Um, and uh, and it's you know set in an old bakehouse, um, uh, and it's got an incredible atmosphere. They break their own bread there, so there's always a wonderful, wonderful smell of sourdough bread um, and this, this delicious take on English cooking. You're making me hungry. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eddie, let me uh, just ask you about, you know, a signature dish or a favourite dish. What's the one you always, you know, find yourself going to? You know, oh, I'll have the thing again. It was, it was, it was a dish that mum um, cooked and, and still cooks. Um, and I suppose you could say it's, it's a, it's a Myokine classic. And um, whether it be milk-fed lamb or lamb... Um, kind of roasted, um, you know, with, with delicious kind of garlic and rosemary, and served with a, a, a vegetable accompaniment, which is called tumbet, uh, and tumbet is, um, you know, it's, it's a real labour of love because to do it properly, you need to kind of um, shallow fry um, all the ingredients separately. So that's aubergine, red pepper, and potato, uh, and that's kind of put into a kind of cake, if you like. Um, so it's layered. Um, and then, kind of, um, with, with a kind of drizzle of uh, of tomato, kind of, you know, kind of uh, uh, kind of homemade tomato sauce on the top, and, and the combination of that with the lamb is absolutely fantastic. Wow, I really like that. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> I'm going to make that. Um, Sam, what about for you? What, was the, uh, what dish would you choose over and over again? Well, I think it's, it's it's always difficult with dishes because it depends what time of year it is. Being uh, we're sort of obsessed by seasonality, so what you want to eat in a hot August afternoon is not the same as you want to eat um, on a chilly December afternoon. But given that we're sort of Christmas time, um, I love eating game. I suppose as a real treat, um, a roast woodcock is a particularly fine thing. I suppose that the, the, the rarity of it, um, you know, because you can't, they're very difficult to, to get your hands on, which means that when you do, there's a sort of extra relishment, but they've got a very um, incredibly um, 
delicious, rich, uh, uh, characterful uh, flavour and um, yeah, well worth seeking out if you can get your hands on one. Well, we've got hungry. Uh, let's taste some wines. My taste with Bependum wine. Right, let's get a wine choice from you, Sam Hart, first of all. I chose um, La Gitana Manzanilla from Bodegas Hidalgo, bone dry sherry from the south of Spain, um, made by the Hidalgo family. So um, Javier Hidalgo, who runs the company now, is a good friend of ours. We've been down to see his winery yes. lots of times, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's a great drink. Some would be raised eyebrows at a, at a sherry, and yet, you know, it's uh, you're making it trendy again. Well, we've been singing the praises of sherry for, for many years, but uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing drink. It's incredibly versatile. Um, it's one of the world's great aperitifs, but it's also delicious with, you know, seafood, with fried food, with jamon, with almonds. Um, and it's, it's the sort of wine that you don't, don't get bored of, because when you're saying desert island wine, I suppose it's, I was trying to think of something you'd be happy to drink to, forever. To, to drink forever, exactly. Yes. And, and what's amazing about Manzanilla is, is that it's clean and, and, um, and crisp and simple. And and you, you I could I do drink it um, you, you know most days. We got a different uh, Manzanilla here, supplied from Bibendum Wines, and uh, this is from Rodriguez the Barbiana. Um, the beautiful colour. I'm just looking at this, and we've chilled it uh, slightly as well. So is this looking looking good to you? Yes, so exactly. It's got that sort of slightly strawy colour, um, chilled. Very important with um. You know, Fino or Manzanilla sherries, you know, you want it really nice and cold um, and, and refreshing. So on the nose, you get that... You, um, Manzanillas come from a town called San Luca de Barameda in the south of Spain, um, and they're aged in um, big oak barrels um, in open-sided warehouses. And the Atlantic breeze comes into the warehouse, and they always say with Manzanilla, you can slightly have that smell of the sea to it. And um, I think yeah. you know you've got that slight salinity on the nose, yes, um, which, which is which is incredibly appealing. But you don't really even need to drink this to experience this, do you? It's it's all no. So much all, all, although, and I haven't had a sip yet. My my guess is when you do, mm. you, you'll get that uh, first sort of um, you know taste of sherry, and then it will develop in the mouth, and you'll get a sort of secondary um, a secondary hit of flavours coming through um, after you've swallowed it. Eddie, do you share your brother's passion for this kind I, of wine? I, I do, and, and, and I love that part of the world. I think with Manzanilla, which is, which is the very lightest style of sherry, so in the sherry spectrum, from the lightest, freshest style Manzanilla that we're drinking now, you know, right through to uh, something that's dark and, and sticky and sweet, um, with, you know, Pedro Jimenez at, at the other end, you know, there's such a variety of different styles. And, but as Sam said, you know, a great aperitif. And there's very little residual sugar in, in Manzanilla. So, um, which is, number one, I, I like that because it's, it's got a very savoury style. And number two, you know, kind of um, good for people who are watching their weight. Uh, definitely, mm. yes. And I, I think this is the first time I've tasted this. And at the top of my list would be that dryness in the fact that there isn't any sweetness in it at all there's so no sugar imagine just starting no sugar or fruit at all so yeah. it's absolutely bone dry so it's, say it's, for instance you'd had that you know you were talking about that baguette that you'd had before yeah the taste the big <laughs> tasting for the head chef maybe a little of this completely clear the palate it is a fantastic palate cleanser um and also weirdly if, if i'm sherry because it doesn't have any residual sugar or fruit goes often very, very well with things that are famous for being wine killers. Um, tomatoes, artichokes, um, things like that, which sort of clash with the fruitiness of, of normal white wine, or, or indeed red wine. Um, and sherry, because it doesn't have any of that sweetness, um, pairs brilliantly with a lot of those things that you often struggle with. Right, let's move on to uh, Eddie's choice. Eddie, now talking about having a desert island wine, uh, you've uh, really pushed the boat out really in the fact that uh, you chose us a, a beautiful burgundy uh didn't you with a nice nice expensive wine which sadly we don't have uh here we do have an alternative but what did you choose um i chose um a, a gevry chambertin from a producer called dujac and it was a wine sam and i really have never bought ourselves um you know smart wine or expensive wine um but about five or six years ago um, Sam went to a, a kind of a, you know new vintage burgundy tasting, and bought a couple of cases. And, and I completely forgotten. I think Sam had forgotten actually that we had these cases, yeah. and they were kind of um, you know just doing their thing down in the cellar. 
and we kind of uncovered them recently and I just so enjoyed um, you know kind of these bottles so I'd, I'd pull one out on special, special occasions yes. um, and a week uh, later they're all gone <laughs> Not quite a week, actually. <laughs> I, I noticed there is. I noticed there isn't one here either that you've uh, prepared earlier. Or, but um, you know, it's it's um, you know, it, it's, it's it's a Pinot Noir. It's a Burgundy. Um, it, it happens to have a bit of age on it. So so that particular wine that I kind of I mentioned um, for my you know is 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 a, just a real treat, and it's got all those secondary um, flavours. You know, that are kind of you know old burgundies have but we but we've got but, something but we're doing equally, something much younger delicious to drink here. <laughs> so well certainly something which will give us an experience is much younger um it's 2013 this isn't it um and uh, it's a, a morgan gamay grape oh, um, what do you make of it both of you actually what's uh... well I, I i love these these styles of, of wine um you know I, I think you know kind of you know light wine you know there's this plenty of kind of opportunity where, where you might want you know a lighter style wine you know at, at lunch if you're going to have a glass of something or um in the summer slightly chilled um is really delicious you know where where heavier wines kind of wouldn't work so well being chilled down um, I think you know these styles of wine, you know, work really well. Sam was um, saying about uh, lack of fruitiness. I mean, this is just uh, a nose full of fruit, isn't well, it's it? It's got that this? lovely bright fruit, which I think is the point. Isn't it that sort of you know um, cherries or you know, this very um, vibrant. Yes. Fruit, you know, rather than sometimes with wine, you get that sort of secondary fruit, stewed fruits or, or overly ripe fruits. So this is sort of lovely, bright, sort of even slightly underripe cherries or something like that. Do you Indeed, think? yeah. I, I think you know, some people are slightly put off. You know, often with, with Morgans, you know, they're, they're slightly more expensive than you might think you would. You would have to kind of shell out for a, you know for a light style wine, but you know, but I, th- I think you know they are worth the money. But beautifully, beautifully elegant, yeah, and, and you know, joyously with in these days where wine gets ever, ever stronger in, in alcohol, it's only twelve percent. So you know, it's a great lunchtime wine, um, a, great bis- a business day. lunchtime sort of thing, Couple or of whatever. And you, even notice. <laughs> and you can go straight back to the desk. <laughs> straight back to the desk. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us on Taste. It's been really great to meet you. I'm just thinking, you've got this wonderful stable of restaurants. As a final question to you both. Do you have your eyes set on maybe a space up one of the uh, new skyscrapers in the city of London or south of the river or somewhere else for another restaurant from the Hart Brothers? I, I, th- I think for the moment, um, we're so lucky that we, we've got a brilliant team, um, you know, or brilliant teams in, in each of the restaurant. And, and I think, you know, we, you know, we feel very proud of, of the, the latest addition um, in Barrafina, Adelaide Street and, and, and very proud of the team there. Um, so I think that just kind of you know kind of you know focus, you know and and kind of you know kind of regroup, and you know who who knows what in the future. But but I, I think you know that you know what really matters to Sam and I is that we're proud of you know e- you know each of the restaurants, and you know uh, and I think you know that over 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 world domination probably. Eddie Sam Hart, thank you very much for coming to see us. Thank you. Thanks very much. My taste with Babendum wine. Find out more about the flavours you like and discover something new by downloading Babendum's free app. Search Plonk in your app store.